Okay. Uh, uh, dear all, a very warm welcome to you all at the Horace's extraordinary meeting. I am Richard Reiki, former CEO of KPMG in India, presently board member of KPMG Dubai. Uh, today we will be discussing the impact of COVID on business and people, how they have dealt and emerged during this turbulent time and how they are transfer transforming their business to be future ready. I have a very esteemed panel with me. Uh, Pranav Banage, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Petronas Lubricants India. David Kali, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder, Expand Hong Kong. Ananda Setio, uh, Ivan, Director, A-Wing Group Indonesia. Ong Lian uh, Lian, Chief Executive Officer, Honest B, Singapore. Toshihiro Toyoshima, Chief Executive Officer, Akuria Investment Company, Japan. Today, the topic that we are covering is basically on COVID and uh, COVID-19, as we know, has been the deepest crisis since the Second World War. And all businesses needed to change, not only to uh, survive, but also to thrive. And how do you work out of this chaos? Even before COVID happened, technology had overtaken our lives and the pace of change was unimaginable. However, COVID has accelerated this and it has changed the way the world works. The DNA of our workplace ecosystem in many ways are requiring special demands and a very different view from business professionals. This has challenged even the most robust business continuity management programs that we have put in place with sudden and urgent tasks to adapting to the new operations and also keeping the organization future ready and also how do you deal with the employees, the upper management and the C-suite. Resilience is a big word that has come up today. Rigidity is no more uh, uh, there for people, you know, how organizations were very rigid earlier. Organizations need to reimagine both the workforce and the work design to be resilient. And how do we respond to this change repeatedly? Because this crisis is not over. We are still in the midst of the crisis. And how do we actually go back to scale? This has also been a test of leadership, the test of the character of the leaders as to how they respond to the stakeholders and what stance are they taking in dealing with the new, uh, with the pandemic related disruptions or addressing workplace anxiety and emotional well-being of employees or rebuilding stakeholder trust after workplace casualties. There is intense public pressure on corporate leaders to behave in ways that are morally and socially responsible. Such testing time requires transformational and visionary forms of leadership. And these leaders who need to communicate a future image to followers, inspire them to identify with that vision and reach beyond their own immediate self-interest and motivate them to contribute to its realization. What leaders have to realize that is when a crisis hits, you just can't rest on your laurels and to think that everything will move along normally. Every captain needs a compass, especially in these uncertain times of technology and social upheaval. And uh, there, were, there is only organized an eye for the future who react quickly enough, not only to survive, but to thrive. Agility has been a big word today. Agility, uh, you know, our traditional way of working and building uh, organizations have changed. Organizations now need to foster an agile culture which can seamlessly adapt to the changing market needs. This involves practices, values and behaviors that enable the business to become more resilient, flexible and innovative. This extended period of uncertainty, it's been more than a year that we have, most of us have been in lockdown, semi-lockdown, you're not able to travel, have forced businesses to reinvent or doing our conference in this form is itself a, a, a testimony of this. A company's continuity is at least as important as its profit margin. HR deserves as much attention as the product team. Thanks to COVID, innovation future, innovation's future will be broader and more humane. The future of work will require realignment in business continuity planning. And today, I think, you know, many companies just to cut cost have been removing employees and doing something in haste will actually impact the model of organizations, the impact which will be seen in terms of lower productivity, etc. So putting people first, caring at the core of the heart of the business agenda for many has created a new sense of camaraderie, reinforcing connections 
and even while people were working remotely and a sense of caring and support for people's well-being well-being has become a big option new workspaces are being designed to be safe uh, inclusive working environment and redesigning the business as usual with new business models and getting ready for the future with the next gen agility with these few words i will now request uh, uh, one of my panel members david with the first question uh, david china uh, mm -hmm. has staged a dramatic economic recovery amidst the pandemic i mean it is really noteworthy and can you share your views on how china bounced back and the general business environment in china post covid and what is the general business environment in china post covid thank you uh, sure sure thanks ricky uh first of all i want to say that in shanghai since the beginning of covid crisis we had only one light lockdown and it ended in march 2020 and so mm -hmm. since then there was actually no kind of lockdown in shanghai i know it's hard to believe for people outside china but the reality is that there have been on just a few hundred COVID cases since my May last year. So here we're living already in the post-COVID era, uh, although sure. we are isolated from the rest of the world uh, because entering China is very difficult, requires quarantine. So we live in a bubble of a market that counts like 1.4 billion people. Um, and this doesn't mean, of course, that nothing changes. We, we wear masks in public places. We show our green health QR code when we enter a mall. Uh, we get temperature scanned by camera, infrared camera, every time we go back home or enter any public building. But beside that, we have a new, let's say, normal life. Uh, we can go out to restaurants, so we are very lucky. Uh, we can watch movie in the theater, travel inside a country. Uh, we can even attend events, uh, exhibitions. Uh, so, of course, uh, it was different when the crisis started in Wuhan. Uh, it was much harder. Uh, the entire state of Hubei was in lockdown. Uh, citizens stayed home for more than two months and the government organized the uh, delivery of the food for 10 people straight at their home. Um, at the same time, on the national level, they tracked and contained every single cluster of outbreak. 10% of the national health resources were rerouted to Hubei and the rest of the country started to reconvert their industry to support the uh, healthcare demands. Um, in the last quarter of last year, China hit the GDP growth of more than 6%, and International Monetary Fund forecast 8% this year. Uh, however, the Chinese government is targeting only 6% for the rest of the year, and the reason is that they are trying to focus on sustainable growth targets. Uh, they include the parameters like uh, life expectancy and energy consumption reduction. Uh, for me, the containment of the pandemic and the following economic recovery was truly amazing. I, I never witnessed anything like this in, in my life. And I believe it was possible only because all the people cooperated, including the foreign community. And maybe the biggest change I see today in the business community is that uh, China is focused more on domestic growth than international. Uh, in 10 days, there will be the, I know it sounds crazy, but there will be the tourism expo starting Shanghai 29 of March. There will be more than 5,000 exhibitors and 600,000 square meters of uh, exhibition. And I hope these impressive numbers can encourage everyone to think that it is possible uh, to go back to normal life uh, very soon, hopefully, for everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, you know, I've been reading about China now. Hearing it from you has been amazing, that uh, bounce back. And I'll tell you, everybody in the world has been amazed by it. And I was reading an article recently which said that uh, the discipline the Chinese government used and the people used was uh, got you all back. And you're the only, possibly only country which has a positive growth in the current scenario. So great. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Toshihiro, uh, uh, Toshihiro, I come to you now. Uh, considering the longer life expectancy, has the business succession planning changed? Does post-COVID scenario bring any difference in the succession planning? You'll have to unmute. Uh, unmute, please. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, well, I, I'm in private equity business. I'm investing into various companies, and uh, many of them are related to business succession. Well, aging society is a trend all over the world, but especially so in Japan. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, the population 
uh, of the age 65 years or plus uh, has been around 20%, but now it's 30% in Japan. And uh, so people naturally after age 65 start to think about their retirement life. Uh, but uh, as the healthy life uh, is extending uh, longer and longer, uh, there's naturally the attachment uh, for these people to keep working and keep staying in the power or keep uh, earning the money, uh, whatever. So uh, the actual age of the business succession in Japan has been delayed and delayed and delayed alongside with the aging society and especially in recent 10 years, the economic cycle was so good. So they are enjoying the expansion of the economy while enjoying the healthy, uh, uh, long, long, longer business, business life. But then the COVID-19 uh, really, uh, which hit hard uh, more on the uh, senior people uh, is changing the, the perspective uh, of the life. And once you become over age 70, uh, you start to think uh, that the, the, the lifespan uh, from the birth, maybe my healthy remaining life is 10 years and maybe I can live 15 years, but maybe healthy seven years, 10 years. And, uh, is, well, is it so important for you to earn more money or to, to be in the control of more power? Uh, that will become the big, big question. And especially after experiencing certain downturn of the economy, uh, it takes minimum three years to get the, the business back to the same stage. So uh, people start to think uh, what was fire for them to do right now. And uh, we, uh, our business is private equity uh, firm. So uh, traditionally in Japan, maybe 80% uh, or 70% uh, many, many years ago uh, of the business succession was to the family. Uh, maybe in Chinese uh, big companies, it may be so still, but uh, now uh, people are changing their, their mentality and, and, and more and more, maybe currently around 50% of the companies, non-listed enterprises uh, being, being, being sold to the private equities uh, or the third parties. Of course, some of them can be, uh, can, can come under construction. So, uh, I have seen, well, uh, so we have been running the current buyout fund started in 2016 and uh, we are investing maybe two companies, three companies a year. Uh, but, uh, once the COVID-19 started, before the COVID-19, the, the valuation of the company was getting higher and higher. And actually it's a US trend. Now, uh, EV EBITDA, uh, which means the, the EBITDA, the value of the company, multiple by the cash generating power of the company in the U.S. is well over 10 times. It, it has reached 14 times last year. Uh, in Japan, it's still around seven times, quite reasonable. Uh, but uh, but uh, prior to the COVID, it was uh, going up and up and up. But uh, once the, the economy was hit by COVID, uh, the transaction stopped for half a year. And then... Uh, suddenly the, 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 the inquiry of the business succession, uh, is getting very large. That's a big, big difference, uh, in, in a way of people's thinking. And, uh, uh, the last thing is that, um, the, the government is borrowing a huge amount of money, uh, which is going to be passed on to the younger generation. So I truly think, uh, it is very important to accelerate the change of the generation and, uh, post COVID. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Toshihiro. Uh, Pranav, uh, can I come to you now? The, what is the impact of COVID on traditional companies? We have been hearing about the new age companies, etc., and on their business processes and people, if you can enlighten us. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'll get straight to it. Uh, I think, uh, Richard, you mentioned in the beginning, I think, what is the, what is the consistent theme of COVID that is still playing out? And in my head, it's always been when I reflect upon this is continuous uncertainty. I think as businesses, you know, we are taught to be in, in uncertainty. You know, VUCA is, has been there for many, many years in the literature. But to live out in is like uncertainty of demand you know there is a 
very low to an extreme spike of a demand that is happening in the markets in Southeast Asia. Uncertainty around personal safety. And then, of course, uncertainty on the supply chain, which I will probably talk about later. later. So this continuous uncertainty, what does it translate into different aspects of the organization is really the key, key reflection point for me as I see. And the translation of uncertainty on different organizations is different. So like for Honest Bee, which is a digital native company, would be different to a, say, a typical oil and gas or, you know, you know, logistics or these kind of very traditional sort of setups. So what is the translation on people? Like people, obviously, they don't know whether I'm going to be in business tomorrow, whether I'll have my job tomorrow. Am I going to be safe? Is my family going to be safe? You know, when you talk about processes, we are talking about processes, you know, can this process deliver the outcome that we wanted because we designed it so many years ago? Can this process run remotely? I mean, I don't need to go there, etc. So those questions come up. And last on this point, which you also touched, is decision-making of uncertainty. I mean, what kind of decisions do we make under uncertain uncertainty? Do I invest now, save later, like you said? You know, do we need to downsize? So all that is playing out in continuum for a long period of time. And that is that is basically leading us to reflect on the organizations when we talk about the businesses here, is it, I mean, it's not really, really resilience. I mean, I would like to sort of defer there a little bit. I think it's more of anti-fragile. Uh, and the reason why I use this term very, very carefully is that, you know, anti-fragile is a, is a, is a property where you actually benefit because of uncertainty. So you don't crumble, but you actually benefit. You don't survive or you don't show resilience, but you benefit. And I think that is becoming sort of a reflection point, you know, where are is everything anti-fragile? Are people, do they perform their best un, under uncertainty? You know, the processes, they, they actually multiply and you get better results out of this under uncertainty. Similarly, on the, you know, decision making, am I, am I becoming more data centric or you know, some of the private equity investments in, in these startups would be like, you know, data on the fingertips, et cetera. Am I becoming more and more sort of data centric in decisions, et cetera? And how do I sort of tune myself for making the best out of the uncertainty? And that is basically, you know, what I see is the organizations will start thinking about, you know, uh, transforming post COVID, as we've said on the panel, is that this lens would be used more aggressively than what it was used in the past, especially on the, 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 the big GDP contributors of the traditional marine, oil and gas, services, you know, construction, these kind of uh, industries. So I'll pause here and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come back to some specifics later in the conversation. Uh, thanks, Pranav. Uh, uh, I learned a new word today, anti-fragile. Uh, at least it's new for me and I think it's a very nice perspective. Uh, you have given me a new thought now to uh, research this and take it forward, but I like the way you put it and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Ivan, can I come to you now? And, uh, you know, as the pandemic sets the work trends, the major work trends, how are businesses attending to their workforce, employee planning, management, performance and experience strategy? This is the question in everybody's mind. So if you can enlighten us or give some views of yours. Thank you. Hear you. Uh, Ivan, we are not able to hear you. Not able to hear you. Maybe take off the headphone. No. Ivan, we can't hear you. Maybe, uh, maybe you, you can change the order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can uh, change the order. All right. Yeah, change the order. Okay, Leanne, can I come to you, please? Uh, Leanne, with all your experience, um, 
in acquiring businesses. Recently, you just completed a deal and uh, you were so busy in it. Very good news from a COVID point of view that deals are getting done, etc. Ivan, I'll come to you. Let me finish with sure, you. Sure, sure. I'll come to you. Uh, so, you know, the one big topic that came up was on cost. And, you know, companies have been cutting cost because just to remain afloat, uh, you know, there have been, I would say, even, uh, you know, deep cutting of cost. So how would you relook if you had to relook at your entire cost structure um, and what kind of advice will you give us uh, on reimagining cost as we look at it? We know contracts are being renegotiated, etc. So your views, please. Correct. So, uh, well, thank you. Um, so uh, just introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Ong Lee An, uh, the CEO of uh, Honest Bee and also the uh, founder and director of Westar Group. So just to give you a perspective of what uh, we have done, um, the biggest challenge in, uh, I guess, during a COVID uh, situation and moving forward in the post-COVID situation is uh, to take a good hard look at the entire organization. So what you will find is that um, in our situation, we actually had to basically downsize the company. Um, so some of the operations, we took the difficult decision um, at the start to basically, I guess, one, remove maybe the non-performers or the people that uh, will probably not um, do so well in a less controlled, regulated environment. So the type of profile of cast, uh, cast, uh, employees that you hire will, I guess, be different, uh, become different now, right? So um, previously, in a more formal setting where you are in office, where there is a proper chain of command, you know, you're giving instructions to your, your staff to basically get stuff done. Um, it's much harder to do that uh, when you're actually re uh, working remotely. So in such situations, then you're looking for a different type of employees, right? They are more independent. They are more self-starters. They are more people with initiatives. Um, rather than being told what to do, you now have to get employees that are more anticipatory of what the company needs or what the issues are and are able to basically either flag up or resolve issues that show up um, on the fly, right? So people who are more, I guess, independent. Um, at the same time, um, for the company, uh, whilst we reduce headcount, we actually have to spend more on the technology platform itself, right? And why I say that is in order for people to be effective working remotely, they need access to data, information, connectivity, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, uh, a Zoom feature, whether it's Google Meets, uh, in the back end, you're going to have uh, your accounting systems online. You're able to basically get information on the fly. Um, for example, if you have, um, you know, customer service handling a customer. Now, you, you might have broken up your teams into separate shifts. The question is, how do you hand over from one shift to another such that the customer still enjoys the same level of service, even though it's a different person handling it, right? So the conversations that basically took place yesterday from that time, um, how do, does somebody else take over uh, at that point? So these kind of situations, you would need, uh, you know, uh, good uh, management in terms of information by putting together uh, handover notes, uh, CRM systems to be able to... Uh, maintain the, the seamless um, handover to the next uh, person that's basically taking over, right? Nothing is more frustrating than a customer giving the whole story and then having to repeat the same story four times over because four different parties are handling the same method, right? That really upsets the customer. So you need to be able to handle that. So as an organization, the investment has to be on technology platforms that, that, uh, allow customers to, to feel engaged, right? And uh, employees to be able to deliver the service to the customer. Because as an employee, you can imagine, right? You walk into a situation where you don't know what's going on. You've just taken the file over from somebody else and you've got one irritated customer. And your first question you ask them is what? Um, what seems to be the problem, right? And that, that the customer is going to blow their top, right? Because he's going to have to repeat the whole story and the entire saga, and that's just going to ruin the experience they have with the customer. So 
ultimately, uh, we're all uh, in the service business, right? We are all there serving a customer, right? Otherwise, you know, we're not in business, right? So the question is, how do we make it in a way that the customer feels engaged, uh, feels that we understand their problem and are able to resolve it in as quickly as possible, right? Again, no good if uh, there's a problem and uh, you tell the customer, oh, I'm going to come back in a week and, uh, you know, uh, and get back to you. So it's not only demoralizing for the customer, it's also very demoralizing for the employee. So um, as an organization, when we cost, uh, cost cut, um, we also need to uh, you know, look at putting together additional, uh, I guess, support that allows them to do this. Right? The other thing that we have also noticed uh, in a big way is uh, the use of data. Right? So data, uh, you know, when you aggregate, um, basically what they call big data and also being able to drill down and profile the customer. Uh, you know, data in terms of their spending, what their habits are, what they're going to do, um, you know, their interests, uh, what they focus on, uh, you know, what they respond to. These are information that's very useful that allows you to create a deeper insight to the customer, not just purely what you read on the internet or our profile, right? Because everybody is different and everybody responds differently. And what you find is that uh, maybe only about 25% of what you say actually registers with a person. Um, a lot of it, or the face-to-face -face communication that we use to experience um, before COVID uh, is lost. So it's very now much more difficult to actually create a real connection with the person um, in a virtual world. So that's the downside, right? So whilst it's very easy to say, hey, look, let's just meet virtually, um, it's difficult to build a level of trust and rapport without actually meeting the person, right? I mean, I see you virtually online, but it's very different from me meeting you in person. So I don't think we're there yet in finding a solution on how to build that, but anything that basically gives you a deeper insight to the customer goes a long way in creating a longer lasting rapport and building a stronger relationship, right? So I'll leave it as here, but yes. uh, like I said, this is uh, a real area that uh, we need to address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leanne. I think it is important about that connect. I think we are social animals and we need to get back to the real world, uh, hopefully looking for it. So Ivan, can I come to you now uh, on the yes. same top on the topic of major work trends, if you can give your views, please? Yes. Uh, sorry for the technical error. So yes, uh, our company, Ewing Group, uh, have been trying very hard to uh, bridge between uh, businesses, uh, especially between both countries, Indonesia and Japan, for the past uh, uh, 12 years. And it's been a very, uh, what do you call it, a challenging year for us for the past one year. Uh, to to you know actually execute our business because uh, mainly the business that we are doing is basically focusing on offline related activities such as building power plants, establishing waste treatment facilities, uh, producing new products, and also uh, delivering uh, digital uh, new solutions. Uh, which I think uh, the, for the initial stage is kind of difficult to do it uh, only by the virtual kind of interaction. So, uh, but uh, of course, I, what we, I, I think it's important also to see uh, things from uh, the other side of things, so, especially from the positive side of things. So that's why, uh, well, you can say that for the past uh, 12 years, uh, we are busy uh, uh, actually traveling, meeting people, etc. And, uh, you know, I think we don't have, uh, we don't spend that much of time to actually organize information in such a way so that we, we can actually uh, able to, uh, you know, do things uh, in a more effective and more impactful way. So we, we, we really try to took the time uh, for, uh, for the past one year to actually uh, strengthen our internal organization. We try to see what we, uh, we, what we are lacking and bringing new people on board and to see how we can actually reform our organization to becoming more effective and more agile and more able to execute uh, uh, you know, uh, our projects. And, uh, and actually, uh, because of this COVID, uh, also uh, we, we try to have more, uh, you know, uh, understanding about the situation uh, because, you know, because of this COVID-19, I have to stay in Japan for most of the time. So actually, I have more time to spend in Japan before before uh, actually COVID-19. So I really, uh, you know, uh, I see the blessing in disguise, uh, even for myself, uh, to see how I can actually understand 
more about the situation in Japan and what is actually the opportunity uh, to whom uh, kind of stakeholders that we that we should focus on so that actually we can uh, you know uh, provide the right opportunities for our, for our employees and able to recruit the right kind of people so that actually uh, because what we believe that this COVID-19 is not forever I think uh, there will be uh, the time where actually we can be normal again so I think uh, and actually the time is getting lesser and lesser so we actually we have actually to try to able to wrap up uh, what we need, we would like to do post COVID nineteen. So it actually in our side it's kind of a really exciting times to actually try to organize and to uh, you know uh, wrap up uh, what the plans that we already have, uh, uh, and that's why uh, we we try to see the remaining time. Uh, before we go back to normal uh, in a positive way uh, so that we can actually uh, you know able to make the right execution and hopefully we can uh, uh, do a lot of things uh, that we can make us more prepared for hopefully uh, the next uh, uh, you know global uh, issue uh, which i think uh, it will be something related to climate change food security and uh, and all that i guess that will be all for me from now so maybe we can talk again uh, in the later uh, um, thank you Thank you, Ivan. Uh, Pranav, can I come to you on uh, supply chain? <clears throat> what we have seen in recent years, many supply chains have been broken and we have found they're not as robust as we thought they were. So are there any thoughts uh, and the interdependencies between different countries, the cost and everything else? Any thoughts around this which you can share with the audience? Uh, sure, sure, uh, Richard. I think uh, I mean, supply chain is perhaps the most under under publicized issue that we are facing uh, why are this pandemic and it's still playing out because you know there's a lot of emphasis on vaccines and how we'll get a travel bubbles and we start moving around everywhere so the human travel is taking a lot of air time per se no pun intended but i think that the actual supply chains of the products from one country to another and from you know from the whole stages of supply chain is really the one that is will be the long lasting impact of this kind of a pandemic because the unusual nature of this pandemic is that everything shut down at the same time. So we've never really stress tested a scenario where everything shuts down everywhere. So just a few stats, if I, if I may, I mean, if you just look at the commodity prices, I was checking the LME and uh, Chicago Mercantile. Mercantile. You know, steel is 26% up, copper 64% ever highest, wheat 26% ever highest. You know, base oil, which is coming out of refineries, 200% increase in price. Uh, if you look at container shipping, TEUs, 100% over last year. Port delays, 20%. You know, so there's so many force measures happening, fires breaking out, etc. So you see that all this is sort of playing out as we are in this pandemic. And this is going to continue because this is directly translating into an increased consumer costs. As you would see, I think in India, Richard, you know that all the companies across the board, five to six percent price increases everywhere. Um, you saw even in the US, people taking, you know, the companies taking price increases in the last uh, four or five, uh, four or five months. I think we had lost Richard. Are you there? Are you back? Uh, so. No, I'm there. I'm there. So basically why, I mean, if I reflect back on this as to why this may be happening is because it's a, it's sort of a cocktail of two things, right? So you have a start and stop operations. And then I said like, you know, the uncertainty of demand. So whenever demand is there, everybody is just sort of jumping on to latch on to whatever scraps that are remaining at, at whatever point in time. So this combination is basically leading us to, you know, this situation in supply chain on top of it, you know, because we have, there's a, in the early mornings, I, I was in some of the other forums, they were talking about, you know, how this is sort of the end of globalization or beginning of deglobalization, sort of a pivot, because we have had a global supply chain uh, has been advocated by a lot of organization companies, thought leaders, consulting companies for the last 20 years. And this is basically a reached a point now where we're going to post uh, COVID, we're going to think of few things as I would sort of wrap my, say, my, my thought with. I think one is that, what is the access to raw materials? I think that'll be the big question that'll come up. The second big question is that this really global strategy, I mean, making a toy is cheaper in China and selling it in Italy or wherever, I think that would be re-questioned. If, if not, may not be entirely changing, but it'll definitely lead to a 
sort of a reflection moment that hey does this really work in a in an uncertainty or in this kind of a situation number 3 i think some uh, somebody was mentioning earlier is the bcp you know business continuity plans and whereby richard sort of leading to more localized accesses so if i want to make a bottle it should be close by rather than you know going out to sri lanka or wherever that is and last but not the least i think uh this this question on uh localization versus globalization would be would be there in the board rooms of many of the organizations what would be the outcome of it i mean we don't know i mean how is going to play out if we get another shock in the industry perhaps people will change but more or less i think is supply chain and these four or five big questions around supply chain would be floating around in a lot of organizations and it will be an interesting space i mean from kpmg perspective or you guys on the consulting space i think this could be a this could be a good yeah. uh, good 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 billing item for the next 2 yeah. to 3 years for you guys to help organizations rationalize okay yeah, pause yeah. here Completely. yeah thanks pranav uh, i think supply chain has become the biggest area uh, one of the big areas i would say uh, lian may i come to you considering all your again your business experience i'm just trying to tap your mind in this business continuity which has become a big issue actually and now uh, most companies have been challenged on it so what are your views on on this business continuity how can companies keep themselves afloat during this period any thoughts any ideas to share well i guess the the challenge you have here is that uh, you know for companies uh, i think the the challenges that face basically differ depending on the size of your company right so for large organizations where you basically have a a, a big workforce uh you are able to basically you know separate your you know based on your business continuity planning or bcp plans uh you've got maybe your team a and team b so i've seen banks and large organizations and what they do is that they have a team that comes in an office in um in day one, uh, on 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 week 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 1 and then a team b comes in on week 2 and then team a comes back on week 3 and so forth right and um so why they do that is uh so that uh, you know and there's no co-mingling of the staff so uh, effectively you have in a way as a company two workforce right uh one that comes in on alternate weeks um and the idea is that uh, you are able to still perform the function um without actually having to cross teams in order to ensure that if for example uh you know uh some team members come down with covid in team a that doesn't then affect business operation uh for team b right so that kind of uh, situation um it's more uh it's more manageable because uh you would have um you know uh, uh, i guess a core management team that manages that and then you got team a and team b and as long as the the handover and uh, the information is is transferred over seamlessly that's fine right now the challenging part becomes when you have a small organization right a small organization where you actually lack resources and that becomes a challenge because you lack resources both in terms of manpower and you lack resources in terms of financial ability right so there in dies the 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 big challenge right so covid has pointed out that big organizations are much better equipped to support and survive uh uh in uh, in a pandemic situation uh smaller companies are, are going to find it a lot more challenging um because of the resource and manpower constraint uh there isn't a very good way to basically resolve it uh save for the fact that you know um you adhere closely with uh, your your health and safety regulations your 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 checks uh you know your your controls to ensure that uh you know um health is is taken care of now um for example a small business like an fnb business right you can't have two head chefs two sous chefs and a whole team um because it runs off a fairly lean margin and uh if you basically have two teams uh, you're just going to have a basically a, a cost blow up so in some situations like that what you have to do is just run a leaner operation everybody's just got to work harder and i can see that long term trend for smaller businesses is probably to amalgamate right so i e to either merge or combine to try to scale in order to basically get economies of scale here in singapore we've been quite lucky the government has stepped forward 
and provided um, a fair amount of financial and, and, and technological support um, for companies, right? But at some point, uh, support is also going to stop. So uh, in this post-pandemic world, I think our organizers got to look at it's not good enough just merely to hang on and to survive. Um, I think people need to realize that things have changed and are going to change permanently, right? Uh, the vaccine is not going to fix um, what we have here, right? It's not possible to vaccine 7 billion people, right? There just physically isn't the kind of logistic capability to do that, right? So we're going to basically have to create workarounds. Uh, we're going to basically um, have to be vaccinated, maintain safe distancing, um, still have the checks, self-isolate where necessary, and create self uh, and a travel bubble, right? So it's going to be a hybrid solution. This thing is not going to go away, right? Uh, COVID is going to be like the flu. We haven't solved flu for the last 100 years. We're not going to solve COVID, right? Uh, we're going to be able to in, uh, inoculate ourselves from this strain, but every season there'll be a different strain. And I think the sooner we accept this new reality, the better it is for us to plan how we're going to do basically move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Uh, we've got very little time. We just got less than five minutes and we've got three questions to go, three panel. David, can I ask you on artificial intelligence, advanced technologies, how are they reshaping organizations? Any views, please? Can I request to keep a little brief so we can try and get as many people on the question? Thank you so much. Sorry about it. Yes. Okay. So I will start with a quick joke. Uh, very common this day. Many companies have a new chief innovation officer. And the name is COVID-19. I guess you heard this before. Uh, but uh, all crises offer opportunity, and this one is not making an exception. So the challenges are very high. It's about survival. Uh, the business is uh, at stake. Um, so what's before seemed a very risky investment into untested or dubious ROI technology, now it's actually the only viable solution to continue operation. Uh, in reality, the process uh, had started before, and many MNC has adopted the startup practices like uh, agileness, continuous innovation, you mentioned before, uh, fast product iteration, MVP testing. Uh, but the crisis is accelerating uh, this process. Uh, a few months ago, I read an ad of the job opening uh, from Bosch China, and they were not looking for a CTO or a technical director, but a tech co-founder. And I, I, I was actually very surprised. Uh, but also intrigued. It means that um, the, the boundary between startups and corporations are getting uh, much thinner. Mm, so um, among many small innovation, uh, some mega trends are emerging. I will try to mention just a few because also we're running out of time. The first is a revolution in the healthcare. Uh, vaccine arriving less than a year. Uh, this was a true miracle, but it wouldn't have been possible without the progress on supercomputer simulation software in uh, chemistry and biology. And Moderna was able to create this vaccine in 42 days. Um, they did because they leveraged their scalable computational power storage on the cloud. And the next frontier will be the AI assisted drug discovery uh, software. I work here with one of these companies, Soft Mining. They, they are raising billions of dollars, and the first result is uh, already uh, possible to be tested. Now, another fast te developing technology uh, is the uh, remote surgery. Uh, a few months ago in Italy, there was a successfully uh, startup that actually completed an invasive thoracic uh, procedure using augmented reality and remotely operated surgical robots. And talking about robots, this will be my last topic. Um, all factories nowadays, they're heavily moving to full intelligent automation. And the main driver in this case is not just saving costs, but uh, being resilient, improving their resilience. So it may sound cynical, but the robots don't, don't take sick leave, right? Okay, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, yeah, I was fast enough. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, we have just run out of time. We'll be just going off the air in the next one minute. So um, I'm sorry, I cannot get all my questions through. And uh, 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 But maybe the, we've got a little more time. Uh, I just got a message saying that maybe you could ask. So can I come to you, uh, 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 Ivan, and ask you what is the emerging? We just heard from... Uh, uh, we just heard from uh, 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 from David 
on emerging technologies is there something on the digital transformation that you would like to talk about and what kind of activities in this post uh, i mean we're still in covid times how do we deal with it ivan okay very shortly uh, ricky and uh, so i think uh, digital i think is important but i think what's more important is how we can, how we should use this digital technology and what we have learned uh, after this pandemic is that how we can make uh, a, 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 a 